<laughs> good evening, good morning. Um, wherever you find yourself, my name is Tara Needham. I am the Assistant Academic Director at the Hannah Arendt Center for Politics and Humanities at Bard College in uh, the Hudson Valley of New York State. If you are zooming in from afar and abroad, um, we are so thrilled to see so many people logging on and logging in for this very important conversation about debt and finance capital. Um, we're also thrilled to be co-sponsoring this event with the Museum of Care and with the Economic Dem Democracy Initiative at Bard College. You know, when we were approached by Mika Dubrovsky, we felt there was a real resonance between um, what she described as the mission of the Museum of Care, which projects, uh, whose projects aim to create a public space to discuss what Dostoevsky called the cursed questions what is power, what is freedom, value, and so on. The Hannah Arendt Center similarly promotes bold and risky thinking in the spirit of Arendt and to aims to create forums for the debate of ideas on pressing topics of our time. There's no doubt that debt and finance capital are such issues that have immense bearing on topics that were of great concern for Arendt, democracy, freedom, the possibility for spontaneity and political action. That said, our participation is not to suggest that Arendt herself would have or that the center necessarily agrees with or endorses all the views of the panelists. Rather, our goal is again to invite and foster lively debate and we hope that participants will respectfully challenge, question and clarify the, clarify the points of view presented tonight. So it's now my great pleasure um, to introduce Nika Dabrowski, who is an artist and an author who grew up in the unofficial cultural scenes of squats and Samizat of the late USSR. She's written for many publications and exhibited at, among others, the Tel Aviv Museum, Galleria Nova Zagreb, Showroom London, Fabrica Moscow, and Apex Art New York. She works on several publishing and artistic projects, including Yes Women Group, Art Activist Feminist Community, and others. After her husband David Graeber's death, Mika and friends organized Carnival for David, which took place in 250 places around the world. Carnival for David evolved into the informal community of the Museum of Care, which is creating projects like the one tonight at the intersection of academia, activism, and contemporary art. So welcome to Nika, our panelists, and everyone participating. So thank you very much for hosting this event. And um, yeah, the, the first of uh, the fight club between Michael Hudson and Thomas Piketty was held on the 10th anniversary of the edition of David Graeber's book, 5,000 Years of Death. I want to say that a lot has changed for the better since then. The public discourse has shifted. Now many people recognize death for what it is, structural violence. Second, the Ed Strack debt was created. And I'm especially happy that Astra Taylor is with us today. Astra is not only shares the ideas of David, Michael Hudson and Steve King that all debts should be abolished but at strike debt is successfully buying out unfair debts, for example, student medical debt, acting essentially in the same way as abolitionists did, uh, freeing people from debt slavery. And I want to encourage everyone who watches today to help them. I would like to announce our next fight club that will be at House Kultur de Welt in Berlin this spring with actors and activists David's friends to perform an imaginary fight between David Graeber and Thomas Hobbes and David Graeber versus Jean-Jacques Rousseau, starring Jacques Servin of the Yes Men, Reverend Billy and Savatri G of the Church of Stop Shopping. Um, this fight is a major point uh, that was explored in David's last book, Dawn of Everything, that he co-wrote with an archaeologist, David Wangro. Uh, in the first fight club, the fight had so many rounds that we didn't have time to answer questions from the public. So in the spirit of the boxing match, 
uh, we are going to have our combat, Michael Hudson, conduct a post-match debrief where the public can ask questions and get answers. So meet Steve Kim, Michael Hudson, Pavlina Chernova, and Astra Taylor. Who won last time? What do you think? We have a problem. Let's solve it together. The game is on. Okay, everyone. <clears throat> my name is Astra Taylor. Can you guys see me or? Okay, great. Uh, my name is Astra Taylor. Thank you so much for the kind introduction, Nika. And I just wanna reiterate thanking our hosts, the Hannah Rand Center and the Museum of Care. Thanks for, for having us. Um, and I, I watched the first Fight Club with great interest, uh, noting the paradox <laughs> between the terms care and fighting. So this will be, uh, a loving debate um, with a lot of, I think, agreement among the participants. But um, one thing I will say is, a, as an activist and organizer working very hard on the issues of debt cancellation, I am constantly encountering critics and criticism. So I will do my best maybe to channel some of the contrarianism that I face when I share these ideas. So my name is Astra Taylor. I'll be I'll be quick, but just to set the stage, uh, yeah, my uh, my my friend, the late and great David Graeber sort of recruited me into uh, what became a kind of debt resistance movement. He actually invited me to the planning sessions of Occupy Wall Street. Uh, so this was back in 2011. And um, I was at that point a recently defaulted student debtor and you know understood that my condition was political but didn't have any people to share that that uh, sense with certainly didn't have the sense that the the wider world you know <laughs> shared my sense of, of injustice, uh, and uh, out of the ashes of Occupy Wall Street, we started organizing around debt, based on the recognition that a lot of people who came to Occupy were in debt for education, for healthcare. Of course, it was the mortgage crisis that that it was the, the larger framework. So debt was everywhere when you started looking at it, and uh, since then. You know, David eventually went to the UK. I kept organizing with people and we launched something called uh, the Debt Collective, which is a union for debtors. And um, we have been organizing primarily around the issue of student debt cancellation, though we, though we also work on other types of debt. For example, some of our co-founders planned the first protest demanding full student debt cancellation and free public college in 2012 marking one T day, the day student debt surpassed $1 trillion, it's now 1.8 trillion. Uh, so math, in terms of pure math, things have gotten a lot worse, but as Nika said rightly, the discourse is much better. Uh, and partly because of the debt collective, we've unearthed the various legal mechanisms by which it is actually very possible for the government to cancel student debt. And we have forced them to cancel uh, upwards of $10 billion of student debt just in 2021 alone. So debt cancellation is, we've proven it's a realistic demand. It's a very popular one. I, I just saw an ad for Stacey Abrams, who's running for governor of Georgia. And she talks about medical debt cancellation in her campaign ad. So I think that's another sign of the times. So I think, um, you know, I won't delay us, but but we are definitely in a, in a moment where I think the question is how can we keep expanding the public imagination on this issue? How can we address some of the doubts people have because not everybody agrees? And then, yes, yeah, strategically, what do we do? Where is the power? And we have a great panels here to talk about these issues and, and to address some of the common concerns. You know, people are worried about the, the deficit, right? Worried about the way that this will affect. Uh, there's a lot of misapprehensions about how personal debt and public debt relates. So hopefully we can set, set some of those straight here. Uh, some of the questions that we can return to according to the, the materials circulated in advance. Should student debt be canceled? I already answered that, yes, <laughs> it can be. Can the government run out of money? What is money? What is debt? Um, so if people, I, I wanna invite people to, to touch on those points since that's what the audience was told they'd hear about. Uh, I also want to invite people to use the Q&A function that is, that is here. We're going to also address some of the questions from the last session, as, as, they, as Nika said, that didn't get answered. 
So I'm going to briefly introduce our panelists, the esteemed uh, Michael Hudson, who you know has been working on the question of Jubilee for a long time and really is in many ways inspiration for David's work, for the Debt Collective's work, really blazed an incredible trail talking about the history and precedence and philosophy of Jubilee and more. Michael Hudson is president of the Institute for the Study of Long-Term Term Economic Trends, a Wall Street financial analyst, distinguished research professor of economics at the University of Missouri, Kansas City. He is the author of And Forgive Them Their Debts, 2018, and J is for Junk Economics, and I assume there are many other books. Steve Keen is an Australian economist and author. He's the author of Debunking Economics, and more recently, The New Economics, A Manifesto. Pavlina Chernova is an associate professor of economics at Bard College and a research scholar at the Levy Economics Institute. She specializes in modern monetary theory and public policy. Uh, public policy. So a warm welcome to all of you. And I'm gonna pass it over to Steve Keen to offer some thoughts on the last uh, uh, Fight Club session and um, maybe give us some, some brief thoughts on debt. What is it? Why should it go? <laughs> Okay, my sound is coming through. Good, all right, okay. Um, the, I'll start first of all with a thank you to Thomas Piketty who, who couldn't join us for this session. Um, it is very rare for mainstream economists to engage with critics like myself and, and Michael and Pavlina. Uh, so it's a, a, a tribute to him that he was uh, very generous with his time. And I thought also he was very generous with his perspective in the debate. If I can characterize how Thomas would differ from myself and Michael, Thomas's recommendations at the end of uh, uh, his magnum opus, Capital, were fundamentally tax the rich. And the attitude which Michael and myself and, uh, have uh, concerning debt is abolish the debt. Uh, now, of course, if you think about what tax is and what uh, interest payments are and what profit are, they're all flows. They're flows of money per year. That's how they're denominated. And what taxation says is, well, let's, re let's take some of that flow away from the rich and directed to the poor. That is the conventional attitude towards taxation. And I'm sure Pavlina will get in here and elaborate that tax doesn't actually pay for anything. When you take a look at the modern monetary theory perspective on how government money is created, the government creates money by running a, right, by running a deficit. So government spending creates money, taxation destroys money, uh, and it doesn't actually contribute to anything. It's the, the government as one of the two primary money creators in a capitalist economy can create the money it needs for any particular task. It doesn't need to tax. So what then is the perspective on tax from, from this position? It is fundamentally that taxation decides whose bank account goes down to reduce the excess money created by government spending. And what we know from the last 30 years or so is that the rich are incredibly successful at making sure it's not their accounts that get affected. So what we'd, what we'd, be, uh, what we'd be doing, thank you, with, um, uh, with, with taxation isn't doing what uh, is the perspective from uh, Piketty's capital in the first place. And secondly, the rich are very, very good at evading it. Uh, now the point from Michael, and I'm sure Michael will elaborate very effectively here on his own, own behalf, but what we see, and this comes out of my own mathematical modeling, I might add, uh, is that debt increases the, the income of the rich, which is quite obvious. It increases the income of what we would call rentiers. But it actually, in, in my mathematical modeling of Minsky's financial instability hypothesis, it actually directly reduces the income share of the workers. Uh, if I, in, in my simple model, which I explain in the recent manifesto, um, the debt is, by, money is in that model modeled exclusively by the firm. That's a simplification I make to start the model. And I did not expect this outcome. But what happened was the profit rate that capital got, the owners of the firm, varied around an equilibrium level. As the level of private debt went up, the level of income going to workers went down. It was a direct relationship. And I explained the causal mechanism in manifesto. I won't try to elaborate here. Um, so fundamentally, reducing the debt will increase the share of income going to workers. And, it's, and, and on top of that, we have the modern monetary theory case uh, that, that the government doesn't need to borrow in order to spend. Uh, doesn't need to tax to finance it. So all the things like student debt are a travesty when you intellectually understand how money is created. I'll hand back to the uh, other panelists. Thank you. Wonderful. Thanks for that. I want to hand it to Pavlina uh, to give her perspective on debt. And, you know, I, 
I wouldn't, it's, modern monetary theory is, is really useful in this, but you know, one thing we encounter over and over again is this assumption people have, and it's because it's part of right-wing ideology in their frame, that you know, the state is like a household. You know, they can run out of money, you gotta tighten your belt and budget in this limited way. So maybe I think commenting on that, if you're inspired to, it would be great. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you for the invitation. Um, I want to start with uh, actually David Graeber's comment on um, paradoxes that we have in our daily lives, how we have turned like absurdities into like common sense, what people perceive to be as common sense. And this idea that the government must behave as a household, and especially when it comes to its financial affairs, uh, is one of those paradoxes that we like we have created such mythology and you know just a uh, uh, culture of acceptance of of this um, basically flawed idea and it's all built on a completely flawed understanding of money on the history of money on the origins of money and I will not go through all of it now but um, just to say that even on the face of it when we consider a very basic, simple reality that the currency in our pockets comes from one place and one place alone, and that comes from the public sector, just when we consider that basic stylized fact, it can't possibly be true that the government needs to get money from us to pay for its expenses when it has the ultimate means, it issues the ultimate means, final means of payment. So um, MMT really zeroes in on that under theorized aspect of the monetary reality. There is private debt, there is private um, money creation of all, at all levels, we use this hierarchical model to describe it, but the public currency is under theorized. And so governments have had this prerogative to issue their currencies and, and even in the old days to stamp their gold coins, they have had this prerogative and they must first provide the currency before they can retrieve it back in the form of tax payments or, or bond, purchase, bond sales. And so what MMT basically stresses is that the, the causality is completely upside down, it's reversed. Um, the issuer must provide the currency before the users can use it to pay taxes, to purchase government securities. So a fundamental contribution from an MMT a point of view is that a government is self-financed, but you must also look at the kind of government you're talking about. We have so adopted these mythologies that governments must behave like households that we have created these monetary systems and these monetary regimes which artificially constrain this very basic prerogative of government. And then we force the public sector to behave like a household, to tax in order to pay. So, you know, countries that give up their own currencies, that dollarize, that accept, or that that actually inherit colonial currencies. You know, they are fundamentally constrained in, in, in many ways in managing their domestic economic affairs. So um, the public sector, we need to be looking at what kind of uh, monetary regime we're looking at, what kind of institutional design we have, what kind of coordination we have between our institutions to meet our economic objectives. So lesson number two from MMT is that zeroing in on these arbitrary ratios, debt to deficit, uh, debt to GDP, deficit to GDP ratio. These are really uh, red herrings. They divert our attention from the important issues. How does the government spend? On what does it spend? What kind of policies do we as democratic polity demand of the government? And have we surrendered them to this false ideology that the government does not have money and that it must uh, pinch its pennies like a household? I'll just pause here and we can carry this further. Yeah, so much to dig into, but Michael, would you like to weigh in or respond to these comments and maybe say anything you didn't get to say in the last session before we well, go deeper? Pavlina is quite right when she says that uh, public debt is not the problem, uh, private debt is the problem. So I wanna pick up what uh, Steve Keen said because he was addressing the issue that kept coming up uh, in the debate and uh, what was the argument uh, with Piketty? Uh, Piketty wanted to tax wealth to make uh, people more equal. The problem is the taxes leave the existing economic structure in place. 
So uh, if you had, if you taxed uh, the banks, uh, the debts would still mount up. You'd still have student debt. You'd still have foreclosures. You'd still have insolvency. But uh, the the, some, the rich would have to pay some of the cost of impoverishing society to the government, uh, which doesn't really need it anyway. Uh, so I don't think that uh, uh, taxes uh, address the problem that Steve and I are talking about. That the economy has a real structural problem. And uh, from uh, what David Graeber and I talked about for years, uh, debt is what the 99% owe to the 1%. Most people are in debt, and most debts are owed to 1% of the population. And uh, paying this debt leaves less disposable income for the debtors, uh, less for students, because if they pay student debt, they can't afford to, to buy a mortgage, to uh, take a, buy a home. Uh, homeowners, I have to pay mortgage debt uh, and can't afford to buy goods and services. Uh, credit card companies, auto loans. Uh, most of the people who wanted to disagree with what uh, Steve and I are saying about the need uh, to cancel this debt that is bankrupting the economy is, well, isn't debt a choice? It's a voluntary bargain between uh, uh, borrowers and debtors. Why do you want to interfere with a free market and the voluntary bargain? Well, the bargain is your money or your life. You want a home or you want to be uh, sleeping the sidewalk? Oh, you want a home? You got to go into debt. Uh, do you want a job? Well, you're going to have to get uh, a degree. Get a degree, you're going to have to go into debt unless uh, your, your parents were uh, bankers or had enough money uh, to, put, uh, to put you through. Uh, so most, uh, most debts throughout most of history weren't voluntary. They were arrears. They were uh, cultivators on the land. That uh, the, There was a crop failure. There was a war. They couldn't pay the debts. Most debts were just uh, regular income that couldn't be paid. And uh, the uh, creditors use the misfortune of society, like the COVID crisis, as uh, an opportunity to make money. And uh, you can see that here in New York, uh, where uh, we all are. Uh, right, right now, there are a lot of people that have lost their jobs. A lot of people, uh, uh, these people either are renters and can't pay the rent, or if they bought a home, they can't pay the mortgage. Uh, there was a moratorium. Uh, Biden uh, uh, said, well, we can't just throw all these people out on the street. Let's have a moratorium. It expires in February. In February, tens of thousands of New Yorkers are going to be evicted, thrown onto the street, and uh, their houses are going to be uh, put up for sale. Uh, and there are a lot of uh, uh, investment companies just waiting to, to pick up uh, all of these houses. So uh, the, what Steve and I are talking about is debt is not in equilibrium. Debt grows exponentially and it, it uh, ends up engulfing the whole economy. And that's why uh, you get to choose. Do you want to keep the debts in place and let the economy polarize and uh, shrink? Or do you want to write down the, uh, uh, the savings of the 1% that are invested in loans to the 99%? Yeah, well said. One phrase from the debt collective to get at this point, you know, they're making your money or your life is we're not in debt because we live beyond our means, but because we're denied the means to live. And so I think it, I, I'm sure people here, you know, everybody agrees that debt, debt abolition and debt jubilee is coupled with social provisions, right? Pavlina's written about jobs guarantee, right? I mean, the thing is, this was the old idea of a jubilee too, debt cancellation plus you get land back or, you know, the means of the means of survival. Um, but you're you're making a really important point, which is you know people are basically, and this is stuff we just see at the debt collective every day in the debtors we speak to who are desperate, sometimes suicidal. <laughs> you know, I mean, this is um, this is such an urgent issue for so many people. Uh, it, debt, you know, makes people poorer, but it also you know makes people sicker, and there's a lot of evidence to back that up. Um, but people are robbed twice, right? They're underpaid at the job and then forced to borrow to survive, and this is definitely a means of wealth extraction, it makes makes the rich richer, the poor poor. So I, another way to put this is that that isn't just about money, it's about power. And you all have hit on that. Um, do people want to say anyone feel inspired to take that up, right? I mean, this is, you know, why do we have this system? <laughs> why does it stay? If we can point out all the ways it's seemingly irrational and fair, you know, why is it so entrenched? And, and that's because this is this is power. It's not just a way to get money. It also keeps people under the thumb of creditors. And David Graper was or not just of creditors, but um, of employers, uh, do people want to speak to that at all? The way debt is obstructs democracy uh, keeps people down. Well, it wasn't supposed to be that way. Mm -hmm. Power debt was uh, the first debts uh, 
uh, anthropologically were uh, the Vergelt debts. If you were in a primitive society and you injured somebody, uh, you have to pay reparations. You have a choice. If you beat somebody up, break his arm, or kill someone, either uh, your family would feud with them and you'd all begin fighting, or you'd pay reparations. Uh, the whole idea of debt, well, every, uh, the whole economy functioned on credit. Long before there was money, there was credit. Uh, if, if you were a farmer in uh, Mesopotamia in 3000 BC, uh, you uh, get the, uh, what do you do during the crop year? Uh, money was used one day a year uh, for the farmers in Mesopotamia. That's uh, when the harvest time came in. Uh, on the, uh, and the debts that they owed for uh, the beer that they drank at the local uh, ale house, and we have the records of the ale house, uh, and for the uh, food or for the horses or for the water. Uh, when you go to the ale house, you'd uh, run up a bill, uh, a, a tab, just like today. And it all came due uh, on at harvest time and everything would be paid. And uh, th that worked uh, except once in a while, there was a crop failure. Uh, or there was a drought. And Hammurabi would say, if the people can't pay the debt, uh, we're going to cancel it because if they can't pay the debt and they become a slave of the ale lady, do we really want the uh, cultivators all to end up the debt servants in bondage uh, owing their crops to the ale lady? And then we're not going to be able to get them to work on the corvée work to build uh, palace walls and uh, temples and big ditches, and we're not going to be able to uh, get the uh, crop taxes uh, from them. So the whole idea debt was supposed to be an equilibrium, and when it couldn't be paid, every early society wiped them out. And all of that uh, occurred until Greece and Rome. It was really Rome that made debt a means of getting, uh, getting labor into debt and having to work off the debt on the land of the, uh, uh, the creditor, and uh, we're still living with the uh, backwash of Roman law. Uh, and that, that's the problem. Our legal system uh, is uh, uh, pro-creditor. And this went against every society that preceded Rome. And that's become the legal system of Western civilization. Yep, really interesting. Yeah, Pavlina, you want to weigh in? I, I love where uh, Michael took this conversation. You know, um, <laughs> When we look at Graeber's book, you know, debt is a social relationship and it became monetized through time. But even early on, there was this kind of coercive relationship between authority, palace, king and subjects. And that was the tax. That's a debt. That's a sort of debt. And that tax was always there to to compel, to force the production of goods and resources to provision the palace, okay? This is unavoidable. And that tax was used to eventually, you know, kind of standardize the unit of account, how we pay these debts. And Michael's work is very good um, in illustrating that when private creditors gained so much power over credit creation, um, then the peasants were obligated to the private creditors. And they were not as obligated to the state in terms of delivering corn and, and barley and grain to the palace. So the palace actually, that weakened the palace capability to do debt jubilees because the, the palace could say, I forgive you your debt. If you had a crop failure, you don't have to deliver the grain to me. But the private creditor would not do that. Now, why does the palace tax? Because the palace not only needed to provision for itself and you know, uh, gain its the riches, it's all power. But also they did build, you know, corvée labor was infrastructure, it was public work. So there was some semblance of kind of public goods provisioning, however coercive that was. That is very much, fast forward to the present day, that is very much the function of the tax today. The public sector, which issues its own currency, does not need to tax, to collect the tax, to finance its public projects. The function of the tax is still for the public to require the public's currency to work in exchange to provision goods and services. And it is, you would, you would, you know, one might argue in a democratic sense, our expectation of the state is then to provide public goods um, that will provision for the community as a whole. Now, what does this have to do with student debt? Well, 
I mean, student debt is one of those debts that actually can be forgiven, that the vast majority of student debt is held by the public sector. It is, there is a small proportion that is held by private, you know, pri you know, privately issued debt and not backed by government guarantees. But as we have set, shown at the Levy Institute, um, it is uh, without major disruptions, in fact, <laughs> to the private sector, which you probably want to create disruptions, you can cancel it. You can have a debt jubilee with student debt. Um, and so I think that broadly, I would think about taxes in this way, that they are, you know, certainly historically a coercive mechanism. They are certainly a force that compels us to work in exchange for money. And now we, and, and we have had, you know, uh, you know, various campaigns about, you know, taxation without representation, which presupposes certain democratic demand, right, that we want the collective to do something for all of us. But we need to kind of connect that to theorizing what the money can do, what the public sector with the public currency can do um, if it is going to tax. And if it's going to attract resources, then it has a reciprocal ob obligation to then, quote unquote, provide for the good life. And this whole mythology that we can't cancel the debt, that somehow it's inequitable for the rich kids to have their debt canceled, along with many other things, are just um, disempowering narratives uh, that we can do X, Y, and Z. Can I elaborate something that what uh, Pavlina just said? She's absolutely, she pointed to the key point that uh, the reason that student debt can be canceled is it's owed to the government not private banks. So there's no lobbying organization that's going to come in and say, uh, you can't interfere with private enterprise. Uh, she began, but earlier uh, she said that the, uh, the uh, debt was the power of the ruler uh, over uh, the debtors. Uh, that, uh, the people that the power, uh, rulers of Mesopotamia really wanted power over was that over the creditors. Every early society stabilized itself by preventing the emergence of a creditor oligarchy. And uh, the, uh, over and over again, you'd see creditors getting rich, then all of a sudden they would disappear from the record. Uh, and uh, the idea is that uh, all the way down through the Byzantine Empire, uh, the rulers uh, would say, we don't want a wealthy creditor oligarchy because they're going to uh, use this labor as an army and they're going to overthrow us. And then they're going to write all the laws and then we won't get any more taxes. Uh, they'll get uh, all of the money and they'll be the, uh, the new king. So uh, the, uh, the, look at uh, uh, China, for instance. China is in the position of uh, to its uh, economy that the US is to the student debtors. It's easy to write down the debts if the debts are owed to yourself. That's why the Mesopotamians were able to write down the debts. It's because they were all owed to the palace and the temples. And uh, they also would make sure that the debts to the private creditors uh, were, were canceled and they'd move against the creditors. So the key in preserving democracy was to have what President Biden calls an autocracy. An autocracy is someone who says the public interest is more important than the interest of creditors. I think this really, you know, for me, uh, coming from the deck, like there's a lot of really interesting strategic questions here, because that is why we focused on student debt precisely for this reason, because we know we, you know, what it, the majority, as you say, is held by the federal government. Nevertheless, the government was pretending it didn't have the power to cancel it. So we had to throw that in its face multiple times and, you know, have made headway there. And, and, you know, if there are leverage points against private creditors, it's that they're violating laws, consumer protection laws, that they're engaging in robo signing or shenanigans, but we have less, we do have less leverage. And I think there's some really, there's some strategic, major strategic challenges that are being raised here. Steve, would you like to come in um, and maybe, uh, I don't know, you know the, the standard you know, response to some of this talk is, you know, but we need the creditors. They're they're productively investing capital. And if debts are abolished, won't they go on strike and not, you know, lend to people? Yeah, I mean, uh, the important point, I think we I like, I like the way that we uh, were taken with Pavlina as well uh, to talking about where this originated, because if we go right back and I'm, I haven't yet, yet I must admit, uh, David Graeber's late, the latest and, and last book, uh, and that's my reading on my flight to Australia on, from, on Friday. Um, but if you look at where this, we all began, humans built societies built on mutual obligation, and we'd actually do things for each other. It was actually like a, fundamentally a gift-based society was the, 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 the really ancient basis of how humans behave towards each other. 
And that has been perverted over time into what we now call debt. It first of all went through the Mesopotamian systems where Michael explained the role very well. Now it's been taken over by the private sector. And what we have is, I divide the world into three major social classes, workers, capitalists, and bankers. And what has happened is the bankers are the ones, the financial sector, are the ones who have completely distorted that original role of uh, the, the thing which makes us a human society and now made it into a form of bondage uh, for part of that society. But the trouble with that bondage is disguised by economic theory. And if you have any exposure to neoclassical economics, you would know of things like what's called the Medigliani Miller uh, uh, hypothesis that says that it's actually up ultimately, if you pay any tax at all, it's better that a corporation be 100% financed by debt. You get uh, the argument that the government has to borrow off the public, um, which really treats money as being something like, uh, as, as my good friend um, uh, Michael Kumoff, the only neoclassical economist who understands money, uh, says that it treats money like gravel that has to be dug up and dumped in some person's um, uh, storage system and then doled out when necessary. So it's like the physical thing rather than a sense of obligation uh, designed either between the public and the uh, government or the public and the private banking sector. So once we, if we, if we realize that, the, that we have two major institutions to create, um, to create money, governments are spending more than they get back in taxation or banks lending out more than they get back in repayments. The question is for what ends are those that money used? When we take a look at the private sector, uh, the, the financial sector has used economic theory without knowing they're doing it, but use economic theory as a cover to finance asset price inflation and to put us in debt in, into, into bondage for the remainder of it. It is not a creative use of money at all. Uh, it, banks, when after the Great Depression, which was the last time we had a serious uh, debt crisis that then led through dramatic transactions of society, bankers were under were uh, a, a despised class in the beginning of the 40s and 50s, and they were controlled. Their role was to provide uh, investment finance for industrial capital. That, back in those days, the level of private debt, the, the, the non-financial sector's private debt was roughly 40% of GDP, and most of that was corporate debt. If you fast forward to the financial crisis, that rose to 170% of GDP, and it was predominantly household debt, and a large part of that household debt was actually what gave us the bubble in, the, in house prices in the first place. So you had a negative, a, a, a damaging feedback relationship between debt asset prices, and ultimately a financial collapse. So we, have, we need to have a decent theory, and MMT is part of that theory. The other part is, is Minsky's financial instability hypothesis. They are quite compatible with each other. And what they tell us is we should reduce the level of private debt. And if you do that, rather than taking money away from the poor rich as well, uh, in, what you do is give more money to workers who spend more. So you actually get, when I've modeled a, a modern debt jubilee, you get a boost in economic activity and ultimately even the capitalist benefit. So this is one of those terrible cases where ideology leads us into a trap that makes everybody off to put some people in power over the poor. Yes, uh, really interesting comments. I'm, I'm here scanning some of the questions from the last Fight Club and we have actually answered a couple of them. Um, I mean, one, you just used the word stabilizing. One person asked, uh, wouldn't um, wouldn't cancelling debts be destabilizing? And you're actually saying the opposite, which I think the research shows, which it actually would be good for capitalism in in a kind of idealized version of it, where it actually wants to share prosperity. Uh, yeah, Michael, pointing the good your thing finger. about uh, cancelling the debt and why it's stable is you cancel savings on the other side of the balance sheet. We're, we're talking about debt, but all this debt is somebody else's savings. And uh, the problem is that almost all the savings in the economy are now owned by the 1%. That's why David popularized the concept of 1%. And the best thing you can do, uh, if you cancel the debt to the 1%, you wipe out their savings and you take away their dominance, just like the 19th century finally took away the power of landlords that they had since feudal times. And that was what triggered uh, in the takeoff of industrial capitalism. You have to cancel this uh, rentier uh, claims on society that uh, the uh, creditor uh, doesn't really play a productive role. He, he collects interest in his sleep, just like the landlord collects interest in his sleep. R landlords, creditors, rentiers, monopolists, they do not play a productive role. So what do you destabilize? You destabilize the destabilizer. 
<laughs> Pavlina, did you have a thought? Oh, yes. Oh, my God, if I can oh. come back. Okay, love you. Sorry, Pavlina. Yes. Uh, oh, okay, sorry, I'll, I'll go then. So, yeah, yeah, okay, finish, Steve, and I'll, I'll step in. <laughs> sorry, okay. Um, yeah, what we, if we did that, I mean, the, that, that is the ideal, let's get rid of the, the power structure, but of course, the power structure's got the power, so we would lose that battle inevitably. So the proposal I've been putting forward, which actually uses the concept of MMG as well, is a modern debt jubilee. And that says, look, there are, uh, there are two ways you can create money. The government can sp spend more than it gets back in taxes. The, the private bank can lend more than they get back in, in repayments. Now, if you use the government's power, you could actually give everybody an equal amount of money and say, if you have any debt, you must cancel that debt. So you create money, which, which means that for the, for the, for the uh, creditor class, what they have is their loans disappear, but they get, they get money in bank account instead. Okay, they get reserves fundamentally. So they don't actually end up losing out. But what it does is by giving everybody the same amount of money, you give far more to the workers than you give to the capitalists and rentiers. And by that mechanism, you actually end up stimulating the economy. You can even set it up so that the bonds, interest paid on the bonds by the government takes the place of interest paid on debt by the private sector. And the rentiers end up coming out getting the sort of money that used to mean the, the role of, of banking was described as the, I think the numbers are three, six and three. Uh, borrow at three, charge, charge at six and be on the golf course by 3 p.m. Now that's where they bloody well belong. They don't belong running, running Washington in what I now call the financial politico complex, get them back on the golf course where their uselessness can be put to something productive. Well, Steve, your uh, proposal to bail out the billionaires is very good for you billionaires uh, sitting there. But uh, the fact is, we really want to leave these billionaires with all the money. This, this debate came up with the Civil War uh, when you wanted to get rid of slavery. Uh, people said, well, if Abraham Lincoln cancels slavery, he has to pay the slave owners. And Lincoln said, absolutely not. Slave owning is wrong, and we're not going to create a new wealthy class to dominate the country by paying them for all the money that they've got from slaves. You don't want to bail out uh, to, uh, to make the creditors whole. Come on, uh, uh, I don't have a billion dollars like you, but uh, I certainly <laughs> do not want to bail out these bastards. All right. I'll, uh, I'll, pa I'll pass on that. Personal well, question. I, so, Pavlina, I want you to respond to this, but I also want to throw you one more question from the last session um, that I think, and this person asked, uh, the main result of quantitative easing appeared to be an increase in the value of assets such as share prices and housing. I'm assuming they're talking about, you know, early 2020 when COVID hit, when the government bought a lot of bad corporate debt. Steve mentioned corporate debt. So the person asked, to what extent are the central banks captured by the interest of the richest in society and what should be done about this? Okay, so that's exactly where I was gonna go with this conversation. I mean, dead jubilees happen all the time. You know, what did we do in 2008? You know, the government stepped in with extraordinary budget and purchased enormous amount of toxic financial assets. It, I, I don't know what else we can call it, if you believe not, you know, making these assets whole, um, you know, so it is, a, it's, a, it's a type of debt, a debt jubilee. Um, what did we do during COVID? You know, we put pause the economy. Uh, governments appropriated again budgets that they had not uh, appropriated in post-war history in any crisis. You know, Japan, I think, passed 56% of GDP a budget overnight. The United States, 27%. That has to concentrate the mind. The government has enormous, the government has all the financial resources that it needs to grease the economic wheels, to pause student debt, to pause moratorium on, on mortgage payments. Um, on, so it's just a matter of choices. Um, I would say that, um, you know, the, the tax system obviously doesn't, doesn't do this. What, what we want to do is simply eliminate extractive services, right? We want to, to eliminate kind of unproductive predatory practices, you know, unsustainable practices. I think that there is a way to certainly, you know, pacify the rentier class by replacing private debts with public debts because those are default risk-free. And that's what we do all the time. And so I think for the debt collective, this is an argument to say you have a public purse that is regularly used for these kinds of purposes to forgive debts of the private sector, we can certainly deploy it for student debts. And I, so, so the question here is um, the state, the government creates the only default risk-free asset. 
That's the only one that can do this. You know, Europe is grappling with this. You know, they have designed a system that they cannot create a default risk-free risk -free bond. And they changed and broke their own rules during the pandemic to make sure that the European Central Bank actually purchases these government bonds to make sure that the bills are paid and there's no question asked. That is the monetary reality. And we just work around it to kind of limit our policy space. So QE, what was QE? I mean, QE was a, a way of basically, you know, ensuring the positive value of something that is essentially worthless. Some insurance on some, you know, derivative that, uh, you know, the financial sector created just to create financial return, financial profits. There's no productive, you know, uh, value to this kind of activity. We are essentially validating the financialization of the economy through QE in order to, uh, to prevent some sort of financial global collapse. Collapse. Could we have done it differently? Of course, we could have made companies whole. We could have made households whole. We could have made big industrial, you know, firms whole. We didn't have to necessarily to rescue the financial sector, which is the way we went about this. And so, um, I don't quite believe that the QE is what fed an asset bubble. It definitely supported values of assets that had no value. The market suddenly realized these are not worth anything. And so we supported those assets. It's that we permit the financial sector to do what it does that feeds this financial bubble. That we don't have the regulations. I don't think interest rates are gonna do the job or stopping QE will stop this kind of speculative behavior. So is the banking sector captured? I, in many ways, and, I, and one of the most important ways is ideology, is this, this belief this, this deep belief that somehow we have to manage our economic affairs through this, this construction, the private market, rather than acknowledge the powers that we have in our public institutions and deploy them. I mean, but part of the appeal of bond financing things isn't just that, well, uh, you know, rich investors get their payments, but that it's a way of circumventing democratic deliberation too, right? That's part of the benefits like, oh, well, sorry, you know, we we have to pay back the bondholders, so democracy goes out the window, right? So there's all these value added for <laughs> the the one percent. Even that is such a mythology. Like, what is a bondholder? It, the bondholder is not financing the government. The government is providing the bondholder an opportunity to earn interest. So it's completely upward upside it's a gift, down. Not a necessity. That's right. We don't we don't need to have. Yeah. I, mean, I like to have treasuries in my retirement portfolio. Okay, it's the default risk free asset, but uh, it's not for pacifying the bondholders that we need to be doing all this. So we got we're getting. I'm just trying to bring in the questions from the Q and A, which is there's a lot of great stuff. But uh, Nicole Brummer said the bailouts in the crisis were like a jubilee, but only for the rich one percent. So we're saying yes, indeed, we could call these a kind of jubilee. How to make sure the jubilee is stolen by the rich? Well, we. I mean, my sense is we haven't figured that out because we don't have enough counterpower. Debtors aren't organized, creditors are. Um, there's all this ideology we have to debunk, but curious if other people have some thoughts about that moving forward. So the next emergency mm. isn't as profitable. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that, that, I think that's a very good point. And, and that comes back to the power structure talk with Michael and I having a difference of opinion on over there. Uh, because uh, at the moment, the power is entirely uh, vested with the creditors and they dominate how the government thinks as well we need to break that nexus uh i i would rather break it by a way that actually shuts them up by stuffing money in their mouth uh which is what they seem to prefer to have to, to do um rather than trying to decapitate them because i've got a feeling that they've, 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 at the moment um they have a, a more powerful way of arguing than i have i wouldn't like to see an abraham's tank uh, abram's tank spinning up outside my house because my arguments for a debt for a debt jubilee um so uh, we we do have in the current situation they will take over everything. So if you remember back when Obama uh, was supposed to be our progressive uh, president, um, there, there was as part of the proposal to solve the the financial crisis was an enormous amount of mortgage reset. That never happened. What did happen was that gigantic transfer from from uh, from what eventually became QE. And just to elaborate on Pavlina to some extent, uh, when QE takes place, that is fundamentally the central bank with an unlimited capacity to literally unlimited, getting reserves for, for, for financial institutions in return for bonds. Now, when they do that with banks, that is just an asset swap, but the bank can't do anything 
with that money. But when they buy them off non-bank financial institutions, which frankly are owned by the banks, then those non-financial institutions end up with reserves they can't get any investment turn out of, so they go and buy shares. So in the, and or housing. Uh, so in that sense, yes, QE did directly boost house prices through the purchases of bonds off the non-bank financial sector. So there's lots of uh, great questions here. Here's a provocative one from one of our hosts at the uh, Hannah Rent Center. Um, if we abolish, this is kind of utopian, begins with a utopian premise in a way. If we abolish taxes and abolish debt, it was gone. Um, and the government spends to provide welfare and services, don't we experience incredible inflation? Is that sustainable? So that is from Roger Berkowitz. Uh, it's not, of course it's sustainable because right now you have a choice. Either the banks create credit and charge interest on it, or the government creates credit and spends into the economy. Uh, why is the government money any more inflationary than uh, bank money? Uh, the fact is that when the government spends money into the economy, it's usually on infrastructure, on, on payments to people, and the production and consumption economy. When banks lend money, uh, create money, they create it just like uh, the government prints money, but they create it for people to bid up the price of houses, for people to take over other corporations, they buy, to buy assets, not for goods and services. So the government creating uh, this money that banks are creating is actually much less inflationary. It will not increase the, price, the cost of housing. It will not in, uh, uh, increase stocks and bonds. It will just be spent into the economy. Uh, and uh, the, uh, the fact that the uh, government creates it as opposed to somebody else is, doesn't mean a thing. I'm going to come back to Michael having a good argument. He we've been at this for a long time. Uh, but I'm actually going to point out that one of the problems with this is that if you look at the scale of government spending back before the First World War, literally in the American economy, government spending was less than 5% of GDP. Now, if you finance that by spending without taxation, that's not a problem because you actually want your economy to get back into before we hit the ecological crisis, which is another question I've seen there. Before we hit the ecological limits, you, you wanted the money supply to be growing by about at least 5% per annum to enable commerce to continue expanding in an expanding economy. But now when, you've, when you go back to the stage of big government, which occurred after the, the, sec, the Great Depression and the Second World War, government spending is the order of 30% of GDP. Now, if you injected 30% of GDP every year in the economy with money that does not itself depreciate, then you would have runaway inflation. So the problem actually is not just the, the, the creation of money, the need for taxation and so on. It's the thing we actually create allegedly has a value which remains constant and doesn't fall. Now, Gazelle, Keynes praised the monetary theorist Gazelle by saying Gazelle's idea of depreciating money was a very effective idea that you could create money and if you didn't use it, it depreciated but rapidly. And that was actually used in the, the town of Orgel during the Second World, during, during the, the Great Depression to fight the, the collapse of the economy caused by the credit system failing. And Orgel ended up having full employment until they were shut down by the Austrian Central Bank. So it is actually fundamentally the fact that money is set up so that it shouldn't depreciate when in fact, when you look at it in an ecological sense and uh, a social sense, maybe we should have created a form of money that depreciated on its own. And then you could have had government spending whatever scale was necessary and the money depreciating over time without needing taxation to, to cancel its excess create, uh, creation compared to the, the scale of economic activity in the economy. So, so I want to skip, yeah, go for it. And then I we'll add to this because I kind of agree with both. Government spending is not inherently inflationary, but government spending without taxation, as Steve Keen is saying, is a very large contribution to the economy and tax, uh, taxes retrieve some of this purchasing power. But I would go even further. Let's go back to the history of money, that, that the role of the tax is very important in the launch of units of account and uh, of what you might call like, you know, the, the, the state money. So what is the purpose of the tax? It is the, the purpose is to transfer resources to the public sector. And so if we abolish that, in, that has implications for the value of the currency currently, uh, cur uh, you know, uh, without a doubt, but also it has implications for this transfer of resources from the public private to the public domain. And so I'm very willing and happy to entertain ideas of collective provisioning, but clearly the tax 
serves this function of providing some sort of resource to the public sector, which today we expect that will be then redistributed in a more equitable way. Real resource, not money. So I want to take us. Uh, I want to take us back to the ecological question that came up in the last session in a minute. But first, there's quite a few questions actually here about student debt, which is what we advertised the panel to be about. So I just want to read a, a couple of them, and I think I might be missing some. Sorry. Uh, ne uh, uh, Nejla asks, how is the National Student Debt Forgiveness Program likely to affect university enrollments? Wouldn't it need to be paired with a future solution such as free college? Is that problematic? I do want to say, you know, and this is partly a David Graeberism, we actually reject the term forgiveness, which implies a that uh, the, the borrower did something wrong. Uh, it's a part of why we try to use uh, words like cancellation, uh, abolition, etc. Uh, and then this ties another question, if I can find it related. There's a, um, in Dr. Graber's book, Bullshit Jobs, he had proposed universal basic income as a potential solution in reducing the leverage imbalance between workers and employers. Could this be a potential solution to reduce and eliminate student debt? I think there were some others as well, but people want to speak on any of those. I'll just sort of dive in. The, 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 Spending for education is one of the classic cases in which the government can spend money into the economy and not have a bureaucrat decide how it gets spent. You give it to the students and say, you spend it. And uh, in that sense, it's, the, it's the, almost the perfect means for government money creation when one of the replies about government money creation is you don't want bureaucrats deciding what to do, you want uh, consumers and you want entrepreneurs. Well, give it to the students. They'll spend, they're the consumers, and it will turn up and the entrepreneurs will try to make, uh, you know, make gain out of the student spending. And, and that is a very creative way for government spending to be undertaken. And the, the, the travesty, that's one reason I'm delighted not to be in the university sector anymore, the travesty of what student debts, how students thought about their education and how a bunch of moronic uh, uh, bureaucratic uh, capitalists took over universities and screwed them up completely. Uh, we'd be have a far better university sector if it was completely government funded and the entry requirements were not how much money you borrowed, but how many how many brain cells you had, and how how well you did in exams, and how creative you were. That should be the barrier to getting into universities. The university should be run by the academic, not run by the bloody bureaucrats and the debt financiers. There's a simpler way of explaining uh, uh, this point. All over most of the world, education is free, uh, and for most of the world throughout history, education has been free. It's a public utility, just like there is public health. That's free. What is the, there's no need to charge a penny for education. China doesn't pay. Uh, other countries uh, have free education. America is unique in uh, charging an enormous amount of, uh, for, uh, for education that should be a free public utility. Yeah. Where you get there by, as you say, with brains. Yeah, and, and this is how I see universal basic income. You know, uh, this is a basic income that is a guaranteed, uh, you know, free access to, you know, what we consider to be the basic essentials of life. Uh, what is social security? It, it is an income guarantee because we, as a society, we have decided that we don't want people to be working in their old age. Um, free public education, free um, health care. I think. Um, I think the, I, the idea here is to rethink what the good life is and how we can attain it. The idea that somehow a income grant alone addresses these kind of deep structural questions, I think, uh, you know, I would challenge that. I think that basic income guarantees are essential uh, for many people who are not participating in, in whatever we call a market economy. But we also want to think about the structural aspects, how we provide this quality of life. I can give you $30,000 a year and you cannot buy health insurance, rent, and all the other things on the market today. Mm -hmm. um, wonderful. I'm going to actually self-promote here and put a little film in the uh, chat that is called You Are Not Alone that I released earlier this year that has some discussion of what you know, free public, we really need, if we're going to have a couple student debt cancellation with free public college, we have to make sure that it's abundant, <laughs> that there aren't also all sorts of, you can have, you know, a public good that isn't offered at the scale that it's needed, and there can be other inequalities that manifest in that. So it kind of gets into some of those deeper questions and problems. Um, the ecology point, 
uh, because people raised this in the last fight club. I think it's, it's important, you know, where, how does this all hook into the problem of growth? Um, I mean, I see two ways. One is, you know, debt at interest locks us into a model of endless growth, right? The idea we're going to have more tomorrow than we have today. So we're pushed to exploit planet and people more. But then also when we talk about a debt jubilee, we often go, it'll boost the economy. It'll be great. There'll be growth. <laughs> um, I don't know. Is that, is there a, a contradiction there? Uh, how does, you know, we're, we're, we're in an ecological crisis. Let's talk about it. Pavlina, you want to go first? You're on camera. <laughs> yes, sure. Happily. I mean, I, I turn to Graeber again. You know, uh, the, the concept of the human economy, that, you know, everything is premised on, on care. Our entire existence is premised on care. It's not on an economy. And an economy, this economy is a construct. You know, it's a modern construct. But if we kind of really think deeply about the human condition of what we do, even in a ca capitalist economy on our daily life, what we do is we take care of our children, of ourselves, of our friends, we entertain each other, we feed each other, we educate each other. Like the vast majority of our work is actually care work, but we have just you know commodified it in this particular way. So the, the environment is this kind of crucial dimension because it's existential. Uh, you know, we can't quite reproduce a society if we have cannibalized you know, the very basic resources on which we vitally depend. So like, you know, for me, it is like a, a fundamental rethinking of what, what is work, what the economy is doing, what its purpose is, why do we have even this market, what is it supposed to deliver to us? And if it cannot, why aren't we delivering it in other ways? It's, it's a kind of reimagining. So the, the climate concern is, I think, you know, the, the, the conversation is quite correct. You know, growth cannot be a measure of success in pretty much anything. Um, and except, you know, like profit returns. And so with respect to these very large existential questions, um, we need to be thinking about the how to's and, uh, te you know, technology, not just purely technical solutions, but also the social implications of these technical solutions. I'm going to dive in with my uh, other work, which is actually on climate change and economics. And uh, I, I have been, if there's only if there's one thing that's horrified me more about the thinking of mainstream economists and how they treat money, it's how they've treated the ecology. Uh, the stuff which Nordhaus got a Nobel Prize for is garbage that should never have been published. And what's come after that is even even worse. Uh, the, the ridiculousness, they are actually talking about a six degree increase in temperature causing no more than a 10% fall in GDP. As a recent paper saying that if we lose every major tipping point on the planet, GDP will be 1.4% lower than if we didn't lose the Amazon, uh, the uh, Gulf Stream, Greenland, the Arctic, West Antarctic. It's ludicrous. It's nonsense. It's garbage. That means we're actually on the edge of the cusp of gigantic ecological crisis. And the only way out of it, I'm afraid, in my opinion, is to, it, it, it's to finance at the monetary side of this. We have to be spending on carbon rather than spending on money. So I'll put a set of, set of proposals together with called carbon rationing. And if you search for carbonrationing.org, you'll find those ideas uh, developed by a guy called Adam Hardy uh, in the first instance. And the idea there is that we'd have a parallel uh, two tube price systems. Uh, you'd get a universal carbon credit, which you'd have to spend as well as spending money. Uh, the universal carbon credit be given out equally. Rupert Murdoch would get the same carbon credit that Michael Hudson got. Uh, but of course, Michael Hudson would never exhaust his carbon credit, whereas Rupert Murdoch could run out in half a minute and have to buy it off Michael. And that would be a form of redistribution of wealth, uh, as well as a way of, of uh, limiting the damage we do to the carbon we're putting out into the, into the atmosphere. There is a, a particular relevance to global warming uh, and pollution to what we're talking about debt. Uh, think of the economy of debt pollution. The debt uh, is growing exponentially, as Steve has shown, uh, and any rate of interest is a doubling time. Uh, think of all this growth of debt, this savings that uh, charges interest that's growing exponentially. This is like carbon into the atmosphere. The models are really very similar. And in both cases, uh, this exponential growth stifles, stifles the economy. And economists are responsible, mainstream economists. They're, frankly, neoclassical economics has to go. The most dangerous thing for capitalism is not these lefties here talking about debt abolition. It's neoclassical economics avoiding the real issues in capitalism. Bravo. Well, I mean, well, it also ties back into the, how we began this, which is the, the pu public money could do a lot of things like finance a Green New Deal, right? Like finance a just transition. That, I mean, that I think is also 
the, the debt logic, the ideology we're in prevents us from saying, well, hold on, we have the money to finance the transformation we need to make sure everyone's taken care of, right? Like that is, that's, that's kind of the core of, of it. Um, I want to ask a question here just because I think it's uh, something that we're all hearing about, um, uh, which is the inflation narrative. Um, this question is one of the first ones we got. Um, as the inflation narrative is increasingly being discussed in the mainstream media as a phenomenon that disproportionately punishes the poor versus the rich, while well, economic theory recognizes that inflation um, operates as a transfer of wealth from savers to debtors, what role might inflation play in modern debt jubilee? Or you know, does this conversation give us any tools to reject the, the narrative we're hearing about inflation right now? If, again, pardon me, jumping in quickly. Uh, inflation can actually be seen as an accidental form of gazillion money. Uh, the inflation uh, actually reduces the debt burden. If the, if the money in circulation is falling in value, uh, while the, uh, we're actually, if the inflation is occurring, it's actually reducing the real value of debt. Uh, and that actually is a, a lubricating thing for the, for the global economy. And since the debt is mainly owned by the 99% of the 1%, I see that inflation actually benefiting up to a certain point, not not in uh, hyperinflation, obviously, but benefiting the poor at the expense of the rich, and that's one reason why the rich are so anti-inflation. So um, I, I think, and Michael, you've done plenty of work on that issue as well. So uh, inflation, I, I would see it as uh, so when it's below hyperinflation levels, uh, it is actually it actually benefits the poor more than the rich. I mean, I'll, I'll uh, step in here. So inflation is one of those other mistheorized macro phenomena by the, by the profession that has been used so effectively to like justify all sorts of things. Like we constantly use inflation as um, not providing enough support for the economy or to make, you know, using unemployment to fight inflation. I mean, that is just like extraordinary feat of neoclassical economics to say that working people have to be the bulwark against inflation. There's no other phenomena that is like supposed to be our defense against, you know, the dark inflation. So it's, it's just that there is just this mythology that we can't achieve both full employment price stability. Number two, inflation is used to uh, constantly disempower government spending because the assumption is the government spending is inherently inflationary, which we know it is, is not correct. The pandemic bears it out. We spend a third of the economy in one year and we see all the inflation coming in from the private sector, from bottlenecks, from supply chains, from, from logistical problems, from shutting down various sectors in the economy globally. And on top of it, this is very well exploited by firms. We just saw today the Bloomberg article that like firms, giant corporations in the United States are posting record profits since the 50s. They're exploiting this kind of partly media fueled fear of inflation. A customer has resigned themselves that this is inevitable. They're not going to run away from their um, from the firm, but also they're monopsonists. Like, where are we going to go and buy our stuff when we have this huge concentration of power? And so they are using the pricing power that they have to be able to extract profit margins that are far higher. I think inflation is definitely concerning to people, and that can be a destabilizing social force. And you want to mind you know, how, you know, what happens to, to folks purchasing power, how they perceive this, but there are ways to deal with this that are not, um, you know, sacrificing uh, growth, em employment, uh, well-being, etc. Finally, what if there is inflation? Are we going to let the planet burn? I do, like this, like to me, that doesn't even make sense. Like we, we cannot wait. We can't like structure the right commercial return or wait for the right inflation or get the right private interest to do the job. We have public money. We have a crisis. We need to mobilize it immediately and we need to deal with it. Then we tackle inflation. There are ways uh, uh, you know, uh, to deal with structure. And I think there are ex examples of, of just you know, structurally dealing with inflation uh, around the world, but uh, I'll, I'll stop here. Yeah, and there's a really, uh, um, um, Sorry, we're a little all over the place, but that's 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 a live chat here. Uh, I think this one is was is important though. All around the world, rising housing prices are locking out first-time buyers or forcing them to take out enormous mortgages. Will a debt jubilee on mortgages affect housing affordability? Uh, you know, and not everyone can take out a mortgage, right? It's forcing a lot of people to be renters, but it is striking that we have historically low mortgage rates. 
you know, uh, they really went down after the pandemic, you know, and you see mortgage rates of 2.85 or 3%, you sure don't see that on credit cards or payday loans or other kinds of consumer debt. Um, so it feels like there's lots of interesting things to talk about uh, this and, and um, uh, so I'm wondering who, who, who feels inspired to take it. Um, and I'm also hearing resonances of, of Michael's comments about the rent, the eviction moratoriums ending. And I think it's just important to underscore that yes, people have had eviction moratoriums, but that rent has been piling up, <laughs> right? It wasn't a cancellation of people's rent. So some estimates are saying people owe 50 billion, $70 billion of back rent. Um, there's not, Michael, go for it. You're muted, Michael. Unmute yourself. It has to be said. Yeah, now, can you hear me? Okay, this yeah. question came up in the third century BC in Sparta. <laughs> when, uh, the king decided that uh, the Spartans were so much in debt, he was going to cancel the debts. Uh, and uh, one of his relatives, uh, his uncle, actually convinced him, only cancel the mortgage debt. Well, it turns out that canceling the mortgage debts, who had the mortgages? The, the rich people. If you cancel the mortgage debts, Donald Trump will be the richest man in the country. The uh, most commercial property owners have um, 1% or a tenth of a percent of their capital. It's all debt. You would be giving the biggest giveaway of wealth in American history to the large commercial uh, in, uh, mortgage uh, uh, property owners that all of a sudden wouldn't have to pay the banks at all. So the last thing you want to do uh, is to give it away. There is a way around this. You would have to, if you are going to cancel the debts on mortgage, you want to make sure that the government gets all of that rental value that you're just giving away to the uh, to the absentee owners by uh, a property tax, which is uh, uh, what what China's doing. Uh, look at what happened in Russia. Russia could have got back all of the mineral wealth and the housing that uh, Rielsen gave away simply by taxing away all of the revenue from what it gave away. So if you do cancel the mortgages, you'd have to replace it with a, with a, a full taxation uh, so that you don't give a free lunch to the most heavily indebted people. The rich own most of the debts. The rich are the biggest debtors. And you don't want to forgive the debts of the rich. You want to forget the debts that people like us owe. And that's, and that's why I'm talking in terms of the modern debt jubilee, right? uh, rather than the old traditional one, because uh, I modeled this in, in manifesto. You would have a modern debt jubilee, which would give you $100,000 per person to repay your debts. And therefore, Richard Murdoch would have your debt fall by $100,000, and Pavlina would have a debt fall by $100,000. I think Richard would note it rather less than Pavlina. So the idea is to do this at an equal level, an equal footing, create the money, use the government's capacity to yep. do that. And therefore, it dramatically reduces the debt of the poor. And in fact, the poor could end up being net, net positive. Uh, while the rich still have those debts, they don't get out of it. So uh, we have to think intelligently about how to do this. And also, uh, I saw one question there about the housing issue. Uh, getting rid of the mortgage debt alone, with the mortgage debt of the poor rather than the rich, um, you would still have the capacity for, this, for the banking sector to recreate debt and get us back in an asset bubble again. And empirical research and the, my own modelling shows that what actually causes rising house prices is rising levels of new mortgage debt. So the way to stop that is to say, and this is again, it means a political shift as well to achieve it, is to say that banks can no longer lend as much as they like for a house. They can lend, say, for example, no more than 10 times the annual rental income for a house. Now that would remove the amplifying feedback that currently exists between new mortgages and house prices. Get rid of that. And, and therefore you get rid of what's actually causing the bubbles in the first place. That's exactly what happened in 1960s. When I came to New York, that's how things work. Uh, banks would not lend uh, to anyone uh, where the a debt service uh, was more than 25% of their income. And now it's uh, yeah. everything's been removed. Uh -huh. You're absolutely right. This is how to do it. The three of us are all talking about the economy as a system, not separating uh, debt in one part yeah. from another and cutting it apart. We're, we're looking at the overall system, and that's not what uh, uh, neoclassical economics does. Lena, do you have thoughts on this or should we move on? No. Yeah, I mean, I think just like we talk about a student debt jubilee coupled with free public college, we you know, there's a problem with how we approach housing. We have to approach our housing as a speculative asset instead of something that we live in. And so there's all sorts of forms of social housing and other ways to provide for that human uh, need. So as we as we get towards the end, I want to start asking questions that maybe 
uh, or even even a bit push the envelope a bit further. So I want to mix two: one from um, uh, one from Chad Elson. He asks, "How much power are we willing to give to the government to manage our lives by giving it the control of the financial water we swim in?" I want to combine that with a question from Nika that I just have to find. Uh, Nika, um, our wonderful uh, co-host, asks. Uh, so the ca so um, so the capital is power. You say that the state or the palace is obviously better than private creditors. I'm interested in whether a situation with more democratic distribution of power is possible, or in other words, what would a society look like where wealth is not automatically converted to power? Um, so both of these kind of loop us back to some of the original questions about the creditor being the state or the private sector, and add some wrinkles. I, th I think that's. I think that's a very, uh, both very good questions framing uh, the, one of the strongest arguments people make against government money is that'll let bureaucrats control what happens rather than letting the public, uh, rather than letting private entrepreneurs control what happens. Especially in the university sector and seeing the amount of money wasted by bureaucratic initiatives there, I'm sympathetic to part of that argument. So we do have to consider how do we stop uh, uh, people who's letting a subset of society control the rest of society. And that, again, is why things like spending on infrastructure, on education, uh, on health uh, by the government, where the government funds those entirely, uh, removes that issue. You decide how much of your economy should be spent in education, how much should be spent on health. The government provides that money. And then that money goes out through the, the professionals who decide how it should be spent. And the individuals receive it. They also decide how that money is spent. So we don't have to get caught up in the situation where a bunch of bureaucrats make stupid rules uh, that waste money and so on. Uh, and of course, at the same time, we're going to come back and say a lot of very gifted bureaucrats and we need to get, to get back to the stage where we can see people in the public sector being there for public service reasons. We need to get that, that, that ideology back in a place and part of the, the nonsense Buchanan has given us where we always regard bureaucrats as bad. But out of that, we've actually had a lot of bad bureaucrats and we need to reform the government side of things almost as much as the private money system. So I would answer this um, to say that uh, it's not so much that the state per se is the issue, but the way the state is governed and captured, right? And so which would be the disempowering narratives that we want to tackle head on? For MMT, it's very clear. Taxes do not pay for government spending. That immediately disempowers the wealthy class. We don't need the taxes of the rich. We don't need them to fund our policy priorities because we have institutions that are perfectly capable to fund what we desire. And so you see this dichotomy of people supporting, uh, you know, universal healthcare, education, etc. But they are uh, kind of surrendering to this ideology that we oh we can't do this because we need to find the pay for. That is the one gridlock that we see play out over and over and over again across the globe. And we need to remove this tool from the conversation, from people's like, you know, like understanding about money. We do not depend on taxes to fund um, these public priorities. I also then uh, am thinking about various ways in which society organizes itself, right? Because we try together to to fill gaps where the state has not contributed, right? If we don't have universal health care, we have solidarity economy. If we don't have, and we certainly can't expect that there will be a bureaucrat that can come into my community and say, well, you should do this, this, and this. Like the community knows like their environmental needs, care needs. This is where my own work comes in that you can actually deploy. You can actually effectively do ground up, support these networks, solidarity networks, endless variety of communities, associations, you name it that can that are already doing the kind of care work that we've been talking about but they are disconnected from this like uh, important source of finance and they're captured in the ideology that they need private credit or some tax from somewhere so i would you know i would actually bring these these two um to change the paradigm the paradigm just a footnote to what you said pavlina nobody has ever said uh you have to pay as you go when it comes to military spending Somehow nobody's ever said, where are we going to get the money? They only say it when it comes to spending into the economy that you and I are talking about, uh, the people. Yeah. 
Well, it's good to tax the rich so they don't have so much money to buy the political influence they have, which, you know, prevents- absolutely. This is this is absolutely. And I think, I, you know, I would go back to the initial conversation. You know, I mean, how high a tax do we do we need? And the, the concentration of wealth is so high that taxing income is not going to do the job. You know, do it 90 percent. OK, we've done it before, but it's just not going to disrupt these other processes by which wealth is accumulating. And so we need to think structurally about just removing these opportunities to make money like that would be my preference of restructuring the economy. Um, and then, you know, yes, you should tax certain activities out of existence, you know, but I wouldn't even say tax, you just ban you know, a certain kind of extraction, you know, maybe, you know, predatory practices, you know, regulatory tools can be used for that. Well, somebody here asked, you know, are we avoiding the P word for planning? It sounds that like this is DT Cochrane. Uh, it sounds like we need to uh, need planning to direct spending investment rather than leaving it to the market. If so, why aren't we saying that? If not, how else do we get where we want and need to go? I mean, I, would, I guess I would also just underscore another theme here, which has been the way these debt relationships, uh, uh, but again, circumvent or override democratic deliberation and democratic planning, um, you know, by saying, oh, the, the, again, the bonds, the credit rating agency says this, we can't do that. It's off the table. Um, but what do you think about planning? Michael, you look- Every economy is planned. Our, mm -hmm. uh, America is the most centrally planned. We're more centrally planned than China, but the central planning is done by Wall Street, not by the government. Every, of course, uh, it, it's, it's centrally planned. The question is, who's going to do the planning? Ever since the, uh, the Neolithic, you had to plan for the crops, you had to plan to allocate resources. The government has left the planning to the, uh, uh, to the financial sector, and the financial sector lives in the short run. Governments are supposed to live in the long term. So we're talking about uh, uh, short-term people uh, looking at what they can grab in the next three months or the year, uh, and what uh, Steve Keen's model and I are talking about are the long-term, uh, which is uh, the public point of view. Pavlina? Yeah, I mean, you know, institutionalists, this is a kind of a starting point for institutionalist economic theory that, you know, uh, planning is always there. The question is, who does the planning, you know, in the early roaring 20s, the cartels and the trusts, and then it was the corporate sector. Um, we have always had planning. Minsky's work, which is kind of, you know, evolutionary institutionalist financial theory, you know, he argues that there was a short period of time where we had um, kind of a managerial economy where the public sector took the larger role of public investment, directing public investment, employment, that was right around World War II and soon thereafter. But then we quickly liberalized and then we had planning by the financial sector as Michael uh, pointed out. So that I think that, that, you know, it's a dirty word, but I think it's absolutely unavoidable if you just look a little closely, more closely at just the institutional structure and the evolution of the economy. And, you know, there are questions we have to ask going forward, you know, how we tackle climate uh, responses. And if, if our insistence is that we're going to have some, you know, private, um, you know, mega corporations through incentives and nudges that they will do the planning, I think we are definitely abdicating our democratic responsibility. Um, uh, yeah. So I want to close this out with a, a really simple and elegant question. And maybe we can channel David Graeber a bit, who had some. Um, but they, they ask, would the abolition of debt also abolish borrowing, right? Um, or are we always borrowing at each other and owing banks? Is it something else that's a problem? But yeah, maybe uh, Pavlina, begin with you, and then we'll go to Steve and then Michael, and we'll close up. Um, I, I think that the question has certain premise that maybe I'm, I'm not super comfortable with because, you know, for me, uh, in a Grabian sense, right, money is connected to debt, but debt is a social obligation. And that's not something that we can kind of cancel and abolish. We have this kind of, you know, a sense of reciprocation to one another. And however we trace the history of those relationships, money has been there. And so money uh, to me represents that. I know what I think the, the question is asking, that we are having this, you know, dependence on privately created private debt. And I think that that, you know, requires restructuring. But can you stop me from giving you a loan? I don't know if that is a possibility. The question is, like, what do we do with that? <laughs> I, I think we've taken the, the current circumstances we're in of a debt crisis, of a, a ecological crisis coming our way then we have to, in that situation, I think we have to fundamentally redefine money. Now, if we think about the question about planning beforehand, 
uh, largely neoclassical economics and, and mainstream capitalist ideology did let the entrepreneurs and let the business people decide how to plan, they'll get it right. Well, if that was true, we wouldn't be facing an ecological crisis. Uh, they are short-term thinkers. We do need the long-term, and the government is normally the repository of that long-term thinking. The trouble is, of course, their interests have been captured by the financial class, and we've, that's, that's why we've delayed action on climate change for 50 years. Now, if we have to redefine money in the context of, a, of an ecological crisis, then most of the money has to be created in response to our ecological needs. And that's where I, my, my idea of a, of a of parallel carbon uh, currency and universal carbon credits would be part of that to limit what we spend because country we've spent too much. We, as, as the human society on this planet takes up far too much of the- well Regarding debt cancellation, minus resources, and that is actually undermining us and destroying our capacity. Oops. Oops. Regarding debt cancellation, when I began my uh, uh, Harvard group on the history of debt in the 1990s, uh, the argument by archaeology by the right wing uh, archaeologists and anthropologists was you couldn't possibly cancel the debts in uh, uh, in a Mesopotamia because who would ever lend money? Well, obviously, as soon as they canceled the debts, it all began, as Pavlina said, all began all over again. And uh, so then the uh, people, uh, the uh, right wingers said, you see, it didn't work. Canceling doesn't work. It begins all over again. Well, of course, it begins all over again. It does work in wiping out the overhead of debt. And then the whole thing will begin all over again until society lets too much debt accumulate. And when too much debt accumulates, then you turn on the, therm the debt thermostat and you wipe it out. Uh, and that happened again and again uh, with every new ruler in uh, the Bronze Age in Mesopotamia, uh, all, through, all throughout antiquity. Uh, so that's just a false argument that uh, these people not only don't read history, they try to prevent uh, uh, anthropological history from being uh, read or, or published uh, just because it's ideologically against their uh, right-wing pro-creditor arguments. Thank you all. We're definitely seeing a war on history these days. Um, uh, so, you know, we know from history that debt cancellation, debt jubilee is possible, but I fully believe we need to build better power to get there. So please join the debt collective, um, get organized. Our slogan, one of our many slogans is you are not alone, A space L-O-A-N. One thing that does is it isolates us. Uh, you know, there's stigma, there's shame. So a, a first step is overcoming that and banding with others. I'm going to pass the mic to Tara from the Hannah Arendt Center. So thanks all for being here. Um, on behalf of the uh, Hannah Arendt Center and um, uh, all of our co-sponsors, Nika and the Museum of Care, Pavlina and the Economic Democracy Initiative, um, I want to just thank everybody for this fascinating excellent, relevant, topical discussion. And um, Pavlina, Steve, Michael, Astra, thank you for your tremendous moderating. And um, I hope that you'll stay in contact with our organizations, including Astra's Debt Collective, the Hannah Wren Center, you can Google us, find us at bar.edu, see more of our events. Um, we have active YouTube channels. And I know Nika, there is there are more fight clubs coming up and it sounds like this conversation is still just getting started. That's that's my, my, my feeling um, that we could still keep going. So, and thank you most of all to our audience for staying engaged, posing such great questions and um, really pushing this conversation where it needed to go. Okay, everyone, thank you again. Good night. Good night. Good night. Ah, that was fantastic. Very, very good conversation all around. Yeah, I didn't mean to tease you about being a billionaire. Just. Uh...